our seventh session together. Uh, for those of us doing this live in Oklahoma, we've had uh, a Christmas break for last week and we've had an ice storm in the meantime. So it's been a, a, a busy time for all of us and I'm glad that you braved the weather to be able to come out this evening. Uh, so let's get right into it. Uh, the transforming power of God. Uh, it has been said that Western Christianity is forensic and that Eastern Christianity is therapeutic. That is, for the West, God and man have a legal relationship uh, that's based upon keeping a set of rules, while for the East, the relationship between God and man is one of healing that transforms humanity. Uh, Western un uh, Christianity, by and large, understands the relationship between God and humanity in legal terms. Our relationship with God is based on assenting to, agreeing to, and then keeping a set of rules of the relationship. Sin becomes the breaking of the rules, and therefore the breaking of the relationship with God, and, and God decrees judgment upon all who sin, who break the rules. Uh, much effort is given in the West to defining and assenting to the rules of God. Uh, right belief becomes very intellectual then, uh, and, and in right belief is the giving of one's intellectual assent to the correctness of the doctrine, uh, to the correctness of the rule. Yes, these are the rules that defines our relationship with God, as well as then acknowledging the, the correctness of that overall point of view that mankind is deserving of punishment at the hands of a divine judge. So we have this, this legal approach, a, a legalistic kind of approach to, to God. And so salvation for the West becomes a means of having the correct method of escaping the punishment, of escaping the judgment for having broken the rules. But the West, in this version, offers no remedies that will actually transform us. Uh, it's, it's pretty cut and dried. You broke the rule, here's the penalty. You pay the penalty or you get someone to pay the penalty for you and then you are acquitted or you're released on your good behavior or, or something. And so there's really no relationship, no, no change that has to occur. It's all an external kind of transaction. The St. Paul lamented that, uh, that he did no good, that, that the good that he wanted to do, he couldn't do. Uh, but instead always ended up doing the evil that he hadn't chosen to do. Uh, he was looking for a remedy that somehow had the power to do what it said it would do. Uh, he was looking for a remedy that somehow could transform him. When he is saying that the, the good I want to do, I don't do, and the evil that I uh, don't intend to do, I end up doing, or the the, the awkward thing that I didn't want to do, we, we've talked about that before, uh, he needed something that could somehow transform that weakened will of his so that he could begin doing the very things that he wanted to do and hoped to do. On the other side of all of this, Orthodox Christianity is therapeutic. It transforms. It accomplishes the purpose for which it is. You see, salvation is not a matter of intellectual acceptance of truth. Rather, it is a person's transformation and divinization, being changed to become like God by grace. Now that's a process at work in our lives. St. Paul asked, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? 
St. Paul was not looking for an acquittal before some angry judge. He was looking for deliverance from death. He wanted set free from the death that was at work in his own life. Well then, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The contradiction between intellectual belief and how we live is overcome by God in the incarnation. You see, we say we believe this, and yet somehow our lives always contradict what we just said. We tell our children, do as I say, not as I do. We, we, our, our behavior doesn't line up. It's not in agreement with what in our heads we've agreed is correct. But Christ overcomes that. For what rules and regulations could not achieve and could not empower us to do in our lives, God has done through the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. It is not hell, but death that Adam and Eve chose. The issue is not hell, but death. If salvation concerns anything less than eternal survival, that is, liberation from the natural mortality of creation. It has no ontological relevance. It is not rules and regulations that set us free from living in death. It is God himself that sets us free through his resurrection. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, I'm quoting Paul. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, I am not ashamed. St. Paul knew the answer when he asked, who will set me free from this body of death? He had experienced in his own life the therapeutic power of the power of God. He knew from experience that in his own nature, with its weakened will, was sinful and perishable. He knew that from experience. He knew from experience that he did not have the power within himself to transform himself into the person he wanted to be. He knew he could not become like God on his own. He knew the difference between being Saul and becoming the Paul that God had created him to be. He knew the difference. By the time he was writing, he had become Paul. And he knew the difference of who he now was versus who he had been. So Paul knew what it meant to be transformed from glory into glory. St. Paul knew what it was to walk with God in the cool of the evening. And in so doing, he experienced the transforming power of God personally. This is not an academic discussion. It's not a theological discussion. It was an existential reality within him. He personally had experienced being transformed by the power of God in his own life. It was the transforming power of the resurrected God in his own life that St. Paul proclaimed. It was not theological doctrines or academic theories that he proclaimed. He proclaimed the transforming power of a person, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. For I am not ashamed of the Evangelion, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek also. I use the word Evangelion because that's the title of our seminar class together, 
Our English Bibles, of course, translate this verse from St. Paul from Romans as, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I haven't used the word gospel uh, for our times together because that's a loaded word. It's a word we've already got some kind of suggestion of what it means or, or so forth. And so we've been calling it evangelion. But he says, I am not ashamed of the evangelion. I am not ashamed of this gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power of God in transforming our lives now. In this life, here already, now already, in this lifetime already. Experiencing the transforming power of God in our lives. Let's talk about playing in a mud puddle. Two children were playing in a mud puddle. One turns to the other and says, you know, if we don't get out of this puddle, we're going to get in trouble when mom gets home. The other little boy goes, I know. And they kept on just splashing in the, in the mud. And the first one again says, we're going to get in trouble when mom gets home for being in this mud puddle. I know, the other one said, and kept on playing in the mud. Now, if the first child really believed he wasn't supposed to be playing in the mud puddle, if he really believed he would be in trouble or get scolded by his mother, what would he actually do? If he really believed he shouldn't be in the mud hole, what would he do? This is not a trick question. <laughs> He'd get out of the mud puddle. His getting out of the mud puddle is not dependent on what the other guy does, the other child, his brother or neighbor, whoever the other little kid is. His getting out of the mud puddle was his choice. And if he believed what he was saying, he would get out of the mud puddle. You see, it's not his words, it's not our words, but what he does that shows what he believes. Let that soak in. It's not that, oh, I believe we're going to get in trouble. No, you don't really believe that. If you did, you'd actually get up and go, get cleaned up, get out of the mud pole. You see, it's not what he believes in his head that counts. It's what he believes with his feet. It's what he does in his life. And it is in our lives where the transforming power of God is at work. Now, I've used that little illustration, and, and it, it, it's the best I can come up with, but I don't want to imply judgment again, even though he's talking about we're going to be in trouble with, with mom. All I'm wanting to suggest is that if you believe something, the proof that you believe it is in your feet. You, you begin to live that. You begin to act on it. You begin to do it. Let me try a, a, a different little story or metaphor if I can. Let's talk about the, the conversion of kites. You know, the, the kites that you put the string on and the tail and they fly when the wind blows, the kites. Previously, in one of our seminars, we spoke of a kite deciding to cut the string of the one who flies it in order to be free and to be able to fly itself on its own. We discussed how the disaster that eventually befalls the kite reveals that the kite was never free to do whatever it chooses. There is a limitation inbuilt in being a kite. Now the kite still has the freedom to fly with the wind when the string is on it. It can move freely as the wind blows, but the kite in choosing and claiming to exist independently in choosing to exist without reference to the one who holds the string has made itself a god to itself. It's made a, a, a god of itself. Uh, I am my own boss. I'm accountable to no one. I don't need any strings. I, I, I am totally a free individual and agent in the universe. Well, the disaster that happens to the kite reveals the truth that the kite was never intended to exist as its own God, 
as its own reference point. The, the kite prefers the freedom, or so-called freedom, of not being tied or attached, not being in a relationship via the string with its owner. Uh, he re prefers that freedom instead of having an orderly and disaster-free flying that would occur by having a relationship via the string with the owner, his owner. To, to make that up about us, at some point, when you read the headlines in the news daily, you can read the headlines out of history and the story of humanity. And what we have is a planet full of kites without strings. We have the headlines of people crashing and burning daily. Now, it may not be the same person every day, but every day we have the headlines of another kite crashing to the ground. We have the realization of another person failing, the crash that occurs. And yet it never gets through to us. It never dawns on us, wow, what's wrong here? Even when we talk about, quote, the fall, that just becomes some kind of theological statement, talking about Adam and Eve back there, and somehow uh, uh, someone trying to apply that to our lives without realizing we're talking about us. We're talking about the crashing and burning that happens again and again, over and over, in our own lives, even if we're trying to do our best. We're not trying to be out there wild and crazy, and yet crashing and burning seems to happen anyway. At some point, we have to admit we are a creature. We are a creature creation created by a creator. Created by a creator in such a way that our very existence depends upon being in relationship with the one who created us. That we have some sort of string attached, if I keep the metaphor going, between us and the one who created us, who's flying the kite, if you will. In our baptism, we die to living a life independent from God. We surrender that kind of life. We take our free will and choose to become like God instead of becoming like whatever we thought we wanted to be instead. In our baptism, that string is reattached, is attached to us. And we are resurrected, as it were, to a new life of learning how to fly as one of God's kites. Our life is different because of this relationship that we now have between us and God. Now, this is not an intellectual ascent. It is an existential ascent. I acknowledge my life was not designed to be lived independently of God. I acknowledge my life is designed to be connected with God by letting the Holy Spirit attach the string and by now, from then on, beginning to fly, beginning to live, attached, connected with God. 
so that I am now forever and ever, amen, attached in my living to God. It is with my life that I acknowledge and confess the truth by doing it, by beginning to live attached. My words and my actions begin to line up. Somewhere along the way, my words and my behavior begin to become in agreement. I, the image of God that we carry within us, the string, if you will, and the likeness of our own behavior begin to agree. When you see the image, you begin to see the likeness. And when you see the likeness, you begin to see the image. And you begin to see the similarity. And when our God begins to look at us, he begins to recognize himself in us. He begins to recognize our looking like the image of God in us. Now, this doesn't mean that we're all created out of ticky-tacky and look just the same. We have our own individuality because this is why it's so incredibly important when we say we're made in the image of God who is Trinity. Because in the Trinity, we have three distinct persons. We use the word persons. We've talked about it before. We don't, it doesn't mean individuals. The, the word person is a word that means and implies a relationship. If you say husband, it automatically implies wife. You, you cannot say husband and not know wife. It's automatically attached there, and you're talking about one that's part of a two. And the same is true with the very word person, even though we have misused it in the English language. The word person automatically implies one who is in relationship with another. And so we are being personalized. And so in becoming like God does not mean we lose our personhood. It means we actually gain our personhood. We are personalized by beginning to know how to be who we are. And as we become like God, we become personal. And so you would remain who you are. You're going to remain you the you that you have been called to be and created to be and will become when you're connected with God and allowing God to be at work in your life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're not going to be made out of ticky-tacky, out of a cookie cutter, and, and march uh, lockstep together. We are going to be who we are, a unique and unrepeatable person, as God has called us by name, into existence. All these things we've been talking about over the last several weeks. Adam, where are you? You see, God is real. And our relationship with him is not based on keeping rules. It is based on walking with him in the cool of the evening. That is, it's based on being in relationship with him, with God. You see, God is calling each of us to walk with him in paradise, the same as he came looking for Adam. Remember, Adam, where are you? Jeff, where are you? Eric, where are you? Brian, where are you? Carmen, where are you? Rachel, where are you? Joel, where are you? He, he calls us. Where are you? I'm looking for you. I want to spend some time. As each of us responds to that call, either by saying yes or no to walking with him. As we say yes, we are being transformed by that response. If we say no, we're being formed by that response. It is that single question that begins to be where our will is at work. I don't think I want a relationship with you. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm too busy uh, planning my own life, my own future, and I got things to do and places to go. 
Well, you got places to go, all right. And the in place is going to be the grave. Mr. Adam, you just chose to unplug yourself from life. And we have been unplugged as a species ever since. And our God, in his mercy, became one of us. We've celebrated the incarnation in order to show us what we're supposed to look like. This is what we are created to do, to become. We're not going to walk on water. We may not do miracles. But the miracle is going to be us being in agreement with ourselves. Rather than being a contradiction to ourselves, we would be in agreement as a person with the image of God that is in us. Again and again, monthly, weekly, daily, God comes looking, calling us by name, interrupting our lives. You got to just, if you flip through the Bible, God's always interrupting somebody's life. I mean, for crying out loud, here's Moses on the backside of nowhere, chasing a bunch of smelly sheep. What's that? Over, what? What? Is that bush burning? What? I think I'll turn aside. Wait a minute. He turns aside. You see, God very seldom smacks his head on. Sometimes I guess he does. But most of the time, he's right over here on our periphery. Just tap, tap, tap. And oh, we're too busy. Oh. He interrupts our life to turn aside. Matthew's minding his own business at a uh, tax collector's table, right? Hey, come follow me. What? I don't even know you, interrupts his life. Saul's on his way to Damascus to kill a bunch of Christians. <laughs> I guess that's a huge interruption, deadpan right in the front. <laughs> Flash of light, and he falls to the ground and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? That, that, I just as soon avoid that kind of confrontation with God, if at all possible. But if that's what it takes to get our attention, it happens. You see, again and again, we are being transformed by our response to the call of God in our lives. And that call is happening unnoticed by us, continually all around us. And this is what we call theosis, becoming like God. You see, theosis is not some generic theological concept. It is personal. It is becoming the unique and unrepeatable person each of us has been called to be. This is where the therapy comes in. Well, I don't want to change. I just give me my ticket so I'm not going to hell and I'll be happy. Well, you can have your ticket and live the life you're living and we'll see where it gets you. There is no ticket to escape hell for flying kites without a string. It's, sorry, it just doesn't work that way. The issue isn't whether you're going to hell or not. It's the issue you're about to crash and burn because you're not connected to the source of life that brings meaning to your life and meaning to your existence and brings peace to you. So God calls and we respond. God called Matthew and he left his tax table. God called Peter and he left his nets. God calls and we leave our past and step into our future. We step into the freedom to be, to become who we don't even know who we are meant to be. If we were to speak of judgment as orthodox, we would say this, we are not judged by our past. We are judged by our futures. We are judged by what we become, not what we were. Look at Mary Magdalene. Look at the lady caught in adultery. Look at Fotini, the lady at the well. It doesn't matter the past. But when God comes, it's to say yes, and let's see what happens in our lives. He transforms 
people's lives. The therapeutic power of God. St. Paul said that the evangelion is the power, the power of God unto salvation. The salvation of changing our lives. And so that we are beginning to live now that life. And we don't have to worry about death because we're already connected to God now so that when the physical act of death occurs, we are simply stepping over that as just a, oh, and we're going on down the road in eternity with God. This is good news. This is the good news. It is the power of God kind of good news that transformed the Roman Empire. This is the message because it's a message that changes people's lives. It's a message that's so powerful and changed people's lives so dramatically they could not deny it even under the threat of death. People don't die for a myth. People don't die for some kind of fairy tale. People don't die for intellectual arguments. We die when we know the truth that is at work in us. And we cannot deny that even to save our life. Because we already have life. The life that is greater than death because we are walking with the one who has conquered death. This is the power of God in responding again and again to God's call. We welcome, we become who God has called us to be. We become like God. That's this term theosis again. This is salvation. You know it's time to get out of the mud puddle. That's your choice. That's your call. After the Allied invasion of Nazi Europe on D-Day, June 6, 1944, Winston Churchill remarked, this is not the end, nor is it the beginning of the end, but it is the end of the beginning. This seminar is simply a beginning. And so you stand at the beginning of your own journey. You have finished the course. But we've not yet reached our journey's end. We've only reached the end of your beginning. This is not the end nor is it the beginning of the end. This end of this course is only the end of a beginning. Now we must let our journey begin. You know, this seminar was created with you in mind. In this country, an average American, if you're some in some other country, with just average people. You may be religious. You may not be religious at all. According to the polls, an average American says they are spiritual, but they have no particular commitment to any religious beliefs. Now, this is not to suggest that most Americans do not know what religious beliefs are. The truth is, almost all Americans, even those who don't believe anything, at least know what they don't believe. Just mention a belief, and the common response is, oh, I don't believe that. Well, that's who this course is created for. For those who don't believe anything, and for those who once believed something, but aren't so sure they believe anything anymore. And it's for... The rest of us who believe, but are still looking for something. 
So we come to the end of one beginning and the beginning of the next beginning. Let the new beginning begin. Let me offer an unsolicited comment. The following are the unsolicited comments I received from a young combat veteran. She and her husband, also a combat veteran, had met while serving in Iraq. She had seen our ad in the local paper announcing Evangelion, the power of God. She came alone the first week. Her husband came with her the following week. They were among the first to be part of this eight-week seminar when it was being offered for the very first time. I had not seen or spoken with them after the last session. I received this e email approximately 12 weeks after the seminar ended. Deacon Ezra, I'm emailing you today because I'm not great at talking on the phone and it is easier for me to gather my thoughts in an email. I have been attending services for the past couple of months since the end of your class. I have been reading the Orthodox Study Bible. It actually makes sense of things and spending so much of my time praying. At the very first evening of your class, you spoke about Evangelion and if you invite the power of God in your life, you'll experience changes. Until a couple of weeks ago, I hadn't thought of that night and how I prayed later that evening asking God to work in my life. For the past few months, I have seen a gradual change in myself that I have never experienced. The only way I can describe it is a craving that is getting stronger and stronger. With all the praying, reading, and church I attend, I just want more and more. I don't know what else I can do, but just keep doing what I am doing. I've attended many churches in the past, went to a Christian school when I was, when I was young, and I grew up in a Christian home. But never have I felt this way. I have never really wanted to be a Christian. The Christians I grew up knowing were judgmental and put more focus on what people were doing wrong and all church consisted of was how not to go to hell. While attending your class, I think you opened a door for me spiritually. Thank you. I really want to learn more and want to be a follower of the Orthodox faith. And it's so hard for me to put into words what I feel. But I am sure you have heard this kind of stuff before from others. It seems so foreign, but feels so right. I hope that you can help me understand all of this. At the sake of sounding silly, I just want more and more of God. I don't know how else to say it. And then she signed her email. She and her husband were later transferred to a new deployment out of Oklahoma City, and I have no, lost contact with her, and I don't know the rest of her story. Evangelion, the power to transform our lives, the power of God unto salvation. We can stop at this point. What I would like to offer is one more seminar. It will be a walking seminar it will be similar, perhaps, to the church tours that we give here. But this one's going to be entirely different. And I don't know if it'll work or not, because I've never done it. I've always struggled with 
whether there ought to be eight sessions or not. We've had seven. And every time I've created an eight session, it, it, it wasn't it. And as I was thinking about tonight, something struck me. I don't know if it was from God or my lunch that did that, but if you're willing to come back next week, we'll find out, and then we'll know whether it was of any value, and if it is, we'll keep the tape, keep the DVD, and I'll do it again the next time I teach, and if it doesn't, then we'll know the difference, and I'll thank you for being one of those here to try it with me. So you can think about that. It's time for our break, and we're actually finished for this evening. And with it being so cold, I imagine we'll all appreciate that. I hope you'll stay and have a, uh, a snack or two. But anyway, I want to say God bless you for being part of these sessions together. I believe that the Evangelion is the power of God to salvation. I believe that what has been shared has power in it, not my power, not my power to convince you of anything. I only have tiny words, small words. But the Evangelion, that little bit of yeast that makes the whole bread, it is that little bitty seed that becomes the great tree. If we will say yes and let it begin, a mighty oak can begin to happen in each of our lives. Well, thank you for being part of our sessions together. God bless you for being part of this. And I wish you Godspeed on your journey in life. Thanks.